Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to our daily Hindu analysis. Before we begin today's discussion, don't forget to join our Telegram channel for regular updates on current affairs. So let's get started with the analysis of today's the Hindu newspaper by looking at an article from the front page of the Delhi edition. This article refers to one of the base camps of Assam Rifles. in the chandel district of manipur that borders myanmar which today has become a key medical camp run by the assam rifles that is saving lives in the region but a few years ago this very base camp was at the very center of manipur's insurgency and the article briefly talks about the history of insurgency in manipur so by using this as an opportunity let's talk about the history of insurgency in manipur in complete detail and cover all the key aspects of the topic as it can be very relevant for internal security under gs paper 3 i'm sure many of you know that the northeastern states of india have been a victim of prolonged insurgency that has sustained over the decades as various insurgent groups have carried out enormous violence across assam nagaland mizoram manipur and tripura amongst the northeastern states manipur in particular has been deeply hit by insurgency led by various groups including the UNLF or the United National Liberation Front the PLA or the People's Liberation Army and has also been affected by insurgencies led by Naga insurgent groups the Kuki insurgent outfits and other smaller insurgent organizations such as the Prepak or the People's Revolutionary Party of the Kangli Park So just like Assam, Nagaland, Tripura and other northeastern states, Manipur also has a brutal history of insurgency and at one point it posed a very serious internal security and national security threat for India. So in this context, it becomes important to understand the history of insurgency in Manipur in complete detail and one should also be familiar with the current situation in Manipur. See during the colonial period, Manipur was a princely state. which was conquered by the british following the anglo manipur war of 1891 but the british did not fully annex the kingdom of manipur and instead manipur became a protectorate of british india so the meethi rulers of manipur were given their autonomy as long as they respected british colonial interests so this in a way led the kingdom of manipur and the ruling class formed by the meethis to believe that Manipur was independent and autonomous of course as a protectorate state under the british so later in 1947 when india gained independence from british rule manipur just like many other princely states was forced to accede to the indian union and it formally merged with the indian union in 1949 with this merger of manipur into the indian union manipur lost its perceived sense of autonomy and independence and within the princely state there was some resistance with regard to its merger with india certain sections especially amongst the royalty and amongst the meethi population who are the dominant ruling class this was perceived as a forced accession or a forced merger with india and this resentment contributed to the rise of a low scale insurgent activity against the indian state back then manipur was not yet given full statehood and to curb the insurgency tendencies and to fulfill the aspirations of manipur it was granted statehood in 1972 by the union government but this failed to curb the resentment on the ground and factors such as lack of cultural connection with the rest of india and a perceived sense of neglect and lack of development contributed to the continuation of a low scale insurgency against the indian state until the 1970s but until then Insurgency in Manipur was a low scale threat but the ethnic divide in Manipur society which was further widened through 1970s and 1980s played a critical role in escalating insurgency and violence in Manipur See to understand this you need to be familiar with the ethnic profile of Manipur as Manipur is inhabited by multiple ethnic groups including the Meethis Meethi Muslims the Nagas and as well as Kukis and several other smaller tribes the meethis in particular and even meethi muslims to an extent have remained the dominant class as previously they were part of the royal kingdom post independence the meethis in particular 
felt let down by the Indian state as minority ethnic groups such as Nagas and Kukis were extended special privileges which were denied to Metis and Meti Muslims. So essentially by 1970s, ethnicity had occupied the centre stage of local politics and very quickly the inter-ethnic rivalry was becoming an electoral and political issue. See, in Manipur, the Nagas and Kukis happen to be minority ethnic groups. But the Nagas of Manipur are linked with the Nagas of Nagaland. And Kukis, in turn, are linked with Mizoram, where Kuki insurgent outfits were already leading a liberation movement for the establishment of a separate state that they refer to as Kuki land. Parallelly, in the Naga areas, particularly in Nagaland, Assam, and even in Manipur and Arunachal Pradesh, Nagas were leading their own insurgent movement and these two ethnic groups, which had the backing of insurgent groups from the other states, they were primarily concentrated in the hill areas of Manipur. So considering the remoteness and backwardness of these two tribes and their smaller numbers in Manipur, Nagas and Kukis were officially recognized as scheduled tribes, which extended them special socio-economic privileges as a result of their socio-economic backwardness. This was resisted by other dominant ethnic groups from the plain areas such as the Metis and Meti Muslims as they felt they were at a disadvantage now since Nagas and Kukis were given the ST tag. As a result of their scheduled tribe status, Nagas and Kukis enjoyed protection in the hill areas where the historically dominant Metis from the plains were restricted from purchasing land. Whereas there were no such restrictions on scheduled tribes such as Nagas and Kukis, and this led to a rising sense of frustration and resentment amongst the Metis. By then, the resentment and the inter-ethnic rivalry had turned into violence between the ethnic groups. And as the Nagas and Kukis of Manipur were backed by the insurgent outfits in the neighbouring states, the Metis who felt threatened started forming their own insurgent outfits in order to further their narrow political agendas. The Nagas from the hill areas of Manipur would get the backing and support of Naga insurgent outfits such as Naga National Council and later the NSCN. And similarly, Kukis would get the backing of Kuki insurgent outfits from neighbouring Mizoram. So this inter-ethnic rivalry became the root cause for the rise of large-scale insurgency in Manipur in 1970s and 1980s. And it was primarily led by insurgent groups such as the UNLF, which was formed way back in 1964 itself led primarily by the Methi community. This was their way of expressing resentment against the Indian state and its policies and was seen as essential to protect the Methis and their rights from the threats posed by other ethnic groups such as the Nagas and Kukis. Over the years, several other insurgent outfits were also established in Manipur, including the PLA or the People's Liberation Army, which was formed in 1978, and the pre set up in 1977, along with smaller insurgent groups such as the KCP, which was formed in 1980. So due to the rise of so many insurgent outfits, violence started escalating in Manipur from 1970s itself. And particularly towards Manipur's borders with Nagaland, these Methi-based insurgent outfits would clash with the Naga insurgent groups. And towards Manipur's borders with Mizoram, they would clash with Kuki-based insurgent outfits where these insurgents would start targeting the other ethnic groups. So as violence escalated by 1980, the government of India declared Manipur as a disturbed area according to the provisions of the Disturbed Areas Act and enforced AFSPA or the Armed Forces Special Powers Act in order to give special powers to the security forces to engage in effective counter-insurgency operations against the insurgent outfits. So promptly, the Indian Army and Assam Rifles were deployed in a counter-insurgency role and from 1980s to early 2000, Manipur has seen large-scale violence committed by all the parties involved in the conflict. But over the last two decades, the scale of violence has gone down with a decline in insurgency in northeastern states because by 1990s, Naga outfits such as NSCN and its factions including Isaac Muiva faction and the Kaplang faction they surrendered and signed a ceasefire agreement with the government of India. Till date, the Naga groups have been negotiating a peace agreement with the Indian government, led by NSCN-IM faction and various other Naga political groups. 
whereas the Kaplan faction of NSCN continues its insurgent war against the Indian state. But overall, there has been a decline in Naga insurgency in Nagaland and as well as in the hill areas of Manipur. Then by 2008, the Kuki insurgent groups as well signed suspension of operation agreements with the Indian government and the government of Manipur. And along with this, other smaller insurgent groups such as Prepak also signed suspension of operations agreement, thus bringing down violence in the state. Following this reduction in violence and ceasefire agreements, the state government launched rehabilitation programs to bring back these groups into the mainstream. Whereas the dominant valley-based insurgent outfits led by Metis, such as UNLF, PLA, etc., which operate in the Imphal Valley region, have refused to officially surrender and are yet to come to the negotiating table. But nevertheless, the scale of violence has gone down in Manipur due to sustained counter-insurgency operations by Indian security forces and also due to improving development and governance in Manipur. However, the imposition of AFSPA in Manipur has triggered a lot of controversy in the state as apparently Indian forces have also misused these provisions to commit large-scale human rights violations. But overall, compared to 1980s, 1990s, the scale of violence has definitely gone down in the last two decades and more or less Manipur has been stabilized and today you see very low levels of insurgency in the state. But however, the threats still remain as insurgency has not been eliminated or wiped out in Manipur because there are several challenges to restore complete peace in the state. The first challenge is that different insurgent outfits and ethnic groups have conflicting demands. Even though the government of India has shown the flexibility to negotiate with insurgents and to work out peace agreements, the demands of various groups and outfits, they conflict with each other. And if the Indian government were to fulfill the demands of one group, it could agitate the other rival groups, thus leading to continuation of violence and hostilities. Along with that, insurgent outfits in the Northeast have a tendency to form proxy groups where one faction of the insurgent group appears to surrender and engage in peace talks, whereas another breakaway rebel faction continues violence, thus complicating the negotiation process. And of course, the mixture of politics and insurgency creates a new challenge, as several political groups and politicians are seen to be directly or indirectly working with insurgents. And also, many of these insurgent groups today have become more or less criminal gangs, which are involved in organized crime as these armed groups engage in extortion, kidnapping and contract killings. But a key factor which has enabled insurgency and violence in Manipur is its geographical location along the sensitive India-Myanmar border. Manipur, just like most northeastern states, has a very difficult geography and terrain due to hilly regions, dense forests and jungles and remote areas. Plus, the India-Myanmar international border is a highly porous border which has easily facilitated the cross-border movement of insurgents where they find a safe haven across the border in Myanmar and they also find it very easy to procure arms, drugs and to get involved in other organized criminal activities as Myanmar is very much part of the Golden Triangle region which happens to be a global hub of organized crime especially drugs trafficking and arms trafficking along with parts of Laos and Thailand. The presence of such a safe haven in Myanmar has been a challenge for India with regard to border management. And as a result of all these complexities, low-scale insurgency continues in Manipur till this date. Next, we have an important article on page number 6 related to environment and ecology, which refers to the rising number of elephant deaths in India as a result of electrocution. Just a couple of days back, an elephant has been electrocuted in Assam, in the Dehing Patkai National Park, thus adding to the increasing number of elephant fatalities as a result of electrocution, which is a direct outcome of increasing incidents of man-animal conflict. So in this context, let's talk about the threats faced by elephants in India in complete detail. See, according to the latest elephant census, conducted by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change in 2017, India is home to more than 27,000 elephants, thus placing more than 50% of the worldwide population of Asian elephants in India. The major elephant states include Karnataka, Kerala, Assam, Tamil Nadu, Odessa and even Uttarakhand 
and they are also present in other states in smaller numbers. In the southern region, particularly in the western Ghats, close to 15,000 elephants are found across Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu and few other states. The second highest concentration is in the northeast of India, covering Assam, Meghalaya, Arunachal and other states of the region. Then around 3,000 elephants are found in central parts of India, whereas 2,000 plus elephants are found in the northern states. Despite these encouraging numbers, it's an established fact that elephants, especially Asian elephants, are at the brink of extinction as a result of drastic habitat loss due to anthropogenic activities, along with traditional threats such as hunting and poaching, which is triggered primarily by ivory trade. And these factors have posed the biggest threat for elephants in the wild. Along with such large-scale habitat destruction and deforestation, the threat of hunting and poaching and other man-made factors have increased the risks and as a result, Asian elephants have been listed as endangered on the IUCN Red List. Off late in India, an increasing cause for elephant deaths happens to be electrocution as many elephants run into power lines, some of which are deliberately laid to prevent elephants' incursion into private land. And some happen to be cases of accidents where elephants run into low-hanging power lines and high-voltage power lines, thus resulting in their unfortunate death. These deaths arising out of electrocution have gone up significantly over the last one decade. And according to data provided by the Environment Ministry, between 2009 and 2019 alone, more than 600 elephants have died in India due to electrocution. Out of these, majority of deaths were reported in Karnataka, Odisha and Assam. As I pointed out, these deaths happen because private landowners, local farmers and plantation owners, they often try to fence their private land with electric lines in order to prevent elephants from destroying their crops. And this represents a classic case of increasing man-animal conflict. Also in several elephant corridors and in key migration corridors, high voltage lines have been carelessly laid and these linear infrastructure projects, they not only fragment the habitat and the elephant corridors, but they also end up leading to accidental electrocution of elephants as they run into these low-hanging electric cables. Studies have established that these risks have increased as a direct result of increasing incidents of man-animal conflict, which is triggered by changes in cropping and agricultural patterns, irresponsible exploitative wildlife tourism, and also due to the long-term impact of global warming and climate change. Also, the expansion of urban and rural settlements and the resulting in-migration of communities into forest areas have also played a role. And thus, electrocution has become a leading cause for elephant deaths in India in the last one, one and a half decades. Amongst the elephant states, only Arunachal Pradesh, Tripura and Maharashtra have recorded zero deaths during this period. But in the other states, Several such incidents are reported frequently and multiple deaths have occurred even in the last two years. But the concern amongst wildlife experts is that in majority of these cases, those who are responsible for these elephant deaths are never arrested or held accountable. And this had triggered a batch of environmental activists to approach the Supreme Court recently in January 2022. And through public interest litigation, they pushed the court to seek a response from the government of India and the states on how they are seeking to address the deaths of elephants due to electrocution. In this case, the Supreme Court had criticized the governments and had pointed out that the rising number of elephant deaths due to electrocution clearly shows the collective failure of the Indian state in upholding the constitutional mandate of safeguarding the forests and wildlife, which is one of the mandated directive principles. Apart from electrocution, other man-made factors, such as accidents with trains, continued poaching and even poisoning by local communities, has contributed to high number of elephant deaths across Indian states. So to address these threats and to protect the elephants, environmental experts have suggested that the Environment Ministry should strictly implement the recommendations of the Gaja Report of 2010, which brought out a series of elaborate recommendations for improving the management of wild and captive elephants, including the protection of elephant corridors and habitats. The central government is already implementing Project Elephant, 
through which financial and technical assistance is offered to state governments to provide high priority in conservation efforts and to safeguard their shrinking habitats and migratory corridors. Plus, Project Elephant also has provisions and dedicated funding to deal with incidents of man-animal conflict through which the state governments and forest departments are mandated to provide immediate compensation to the victims of elephant attacks which are increasing and also to compensate the locals for any loss to property or crops so that they don't take out their anger and resentment against the elephants. Plus the Environment Ministry through Project Elephant itself has constituted a task force to suggest eco-friendly measures which can be implemented by the state governments and the power companies so that strict rules and protocols are laid down for installing power cables in order to minimize elephant deaths due to electrocution. Along with this, private landowners who illegally fence their lands with high voltage lines that leads to elephant deaths need to be held accountable as per the law and strict punishments have to be delivered for both negligence and malicious acts. Even the state governments through their forest departments have taken up several measures to reduce incidents of man-animal conflict by setting up elephant-proof trenches, by installing solar-powered electric fencing which does not electrocute the elephants and they have even implemented traditional barriers such as elephant-proof walls, stone pitch trenches and in states like Kerala, the forest department has created natural wall-based defences like Kayala and even technology-based tools have been implemented for biofencing the elephants to minimize human-animal conflict. At the local level, forest departments have formed rapid response teams so they can act immediately in case of emergencies and also promote greater awareness amongst local communities. So such collective efforts from all stakeholders is needed to protect the elephants which are facing increasing threats to their existence. Now let's take up an article from page number 14 which examines the collegium system of appointment of judges and the controversy surrounding the collegium system. See the topic is in news because recently the Supreme Court Collegium headed by the Chief Justice of India was supposed to meet on the 30th of September to decide upon the appointment of the next Chief Justice of India but without notice the meeting was suspended by citing that there was no need for further deliberation to choose the next Chief Justice of India. Later, when the Union Law Minister asked the Chief Justice to nominate his successor as the current Chief Justice term is about to end, the Collegium refused to meet again to decide upon the next Chief Justice and as per usual practice in convention, the next senior most judge, Justice D.Y. Chandrachud, has been recommended by the Collegium as the next Chief Justice of India. So this opaque manner in which the Collegium functions with regard to appointment of judges and the Chief Justice has attracted a lot of controversy and attention to the collegium system itself. So in this context, it becomes important to understand what is a collegium and how does it appoint judges. The collegium system is a mechanism through which judges of the Supreme Court and High Courts are appointed and the collegium also handles the transfers of judges from one High Court to another. This system of appointing and transferring judges it is not rooted in the constitution, does not have any constitutional backing or even legal backing. This system came into being through a series of judgments of the Supreme Court delivered in the 1990s, which are collectively referred to as the three judges case. See, if you look at the constitution, the constitution says that a Supreme Court judge, including the Chief Justice of India, is appointed by the president in consultation with the Chief Justice of India. This of course is not a discretionary power enjoyed by the President and the President here is bound by the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. But however, when it comes to choosing and appointing judges to High Court and Supreme Court, even the Executive, that is the Council of Ministers, do not have discretionary powers as they are bound by the recommendations of the Collegium. This informal and opaque system of appointing and transferring judges called the Collegium system came into being through the three judges case. In the first judges case, the Supreme Court held that the consultation with the Chief Justice of India, which the President is supposed to have while appointing the judges, should be full and effective, thus giving the Chief Justice 
greater control over the appointment and transfer process where the government was bound to follow the recommendations provided by the chief justice in the second judge's case the collegium system was introduced by the supreme court in 1993 and the supreme court ruled that the chief justice of india would have to consult a collegium of his two senior most judges in the supreme court with regard to judicial appointments and transfers then in the third judge's case of 1998 the supreme court expanded the collegium to its present composition which essentially made it a five member body that is headed by the chief justice of india along with the four senior most judges of the supreme court similarly at high courts a high court collegium is led by the incumbent chief justice along with two senior most judges of the high court so with regard to appointment of judges to the supreme court and also with regard to appointment of the next chief justice of india the collegium recommends the names to the government which more or less becomes binding on the president with regard to appointments and transfers of the high court the names recommended by the high court collegium is forwarded to the government once it is approved by the supreme court collegium headed by the chief justice of india so essentially through the collegium system the judiciary has given upon itself the powers and responsibility to determine appointments and transfers whereas the government has been given a minimal role thus leading to a constant controversy around the collegium system in the process of appointing judges the government's role is very minimal where it just gets a background check conducted through the intelligence bureau that is essentially before new judges enter the higher judiciary who are often lawyers a thorough background check is conducted by the ib on behalf of the government once the names are recommended by the collegium the government can raise objections and even seek clarification from the collegium but if the collegium reiterates the same names then the government that is essentially the president is bound to appoint them as the next judges but quite often when the government is not happy with the names that have been recommended it often delays the appointment as the government enjoys the discretion to withhold and delay appointments which has often led to a standoff between the judiciary and the executive so it's in this context that we need to have a basic insight into the criticism surrounding the collegium system the critics of the system have pointed out that the collegium system of appointment of judges to higher judiciary is opaque and non transparent because this entire process led by the judiciary itself is a closed door affair and the whole process doesn't seem to follow any formally established procedure or mechanism and publicly there appears to be no norms regarding eligibility or even with regard to the selection procedure and also the entire proceedings of the collegium is completely out of bounds for the public and even for the government even the deliberations of the collegium they are not recorded as minutes of the meeting and hence the collegium system of appointment of judges has become a non transparent opaque system which leads to criticism against the judiciary as this represents a case of conflict of interest while the judiciary defends the system as an absolutely essential feature of the basic structure of the constitution in order to maintain the independence of the judiciary from any unnecessary interference of the executive it has often led to questions over transparency and merit which appears to be neglected by the judiciary as a result of the opaqueness of the process now let's look at another article from page number 14 which examines the work of nobel laureates who won this year's nobel prize for economics See for 2022 the Nobel Prize Committee has chosen Ben S Bernanke the former chairman of the US Federal Reserve along with two top economists Douglas W Diamond and Philip Dybvig as this year's Nobel laureates for the prestigious Sveriges Riksbank prize or essentially the Nobel Prize for Economics these three economists have been recognized by the Nobel Committee for their pioneering work with regard to research on banks and their roles in financial crises this critical research undertaken by these economists dates back to the 1980s and their efforts are being recognized now as their research constitutes the foundation of modern banking research and the role of banks in managing the economy and in handling financial crisis situations if you look at ben bernanke the former chairman of the us federal reserve He led the US central bank during a critical period that's between 2006 and 
when the global economy faced a major recession following the subprime mortgage crisis that was triggered in the US in 2008-2009. During his days as a research scholar, he studied the greatest economic crisis of 1930s, that is the Great Depression, that essentially began in the US and had a worldwide impact. Based on this study and research, he came out with an article in 1983, which highlighted that economic crisis not only pushes banks towards their failure, but also the corresponding failure of banks during a crisis further pushes the economy into a greater depression. Because when large banks collapse during a crisis, they not only erode the fortunes of the depositors who have deposited their money with the banks, but they also lose the profile of the borrowers, thereby hampering a key business element of the banks, which is to provide credit and loans. As banks lose their ability to provide fresh loans during a crisis, it further affects investments and pushes the economy into a deeper crisis, thus aggravating the recession. Ben Bernang justified his theory with empirical evidence and showed how economic crisis not only contributes to the collapse of a bank, but the collapse of banks during a crisis and the failure of governments to support them will further deepen the crisis as it affects the entire investment and credit cycle. This research of Ben Bernanke completely altered the traditional understanding of the role of banks during financial crisis and thereby pushed governments and central banks to support the banking system during periods of crisis so that the lending activities could continue. And this serves as the ideological basis for stimulus packages that are announced by governments and central banks during periods of crisis. Then the other two economists who hold doctorates from the prestigious Yale University, they came out with a theoretical model in 1983 on the role of banks in the economy. They pointed out in their research how banks and their deposits are vulnerable during a crisis because even a small rumor regarding the financial health of the bank can push the depositors to immediately run to the bank and withdraw their money. And as banks will be forced to honor the withdrawal demands, it will lead to a critical asset liability mismatch as most banks will not have immediate cash to honor the requirements even though the bank itself is in a healthy financial condition because the depositor's money would have been used as capital by the banks to provide loans and credits and immediately it won't be possible for the banks to mobilize the liquidity needed to address the sudden rise in demand for withdrawals. This could affect the financial stability of the bank itself even though the bank was in a healthy condition, thus pushing banks into a deep crisis and further leading to a domino effect on the economy. So based on this analysis, the two economists suggested a framework through which governments and central banks could support the banking system during a crisis. And they suggested solutions such as deposit insurance and central bank acting as the lender of last resort so that governments and central banks can avoid catastrophic failures of the banking system which is crucial for overcoming an economic crisis. If depositors are guaranteed that their deposits are backed by the government, even during a crisis, even when rumors start flying about the health of a bank, the depositors will remain assured that their wealth is safe as their deposits are backed by the state. And this is what led to the concept of deposit insurance schemes, which is in place in most countries today, including in India. So the findings and theories of these three economists have played a critical role in understanding the roles of banks in the financial system, especially during an economic crisis. And their research has offered key lessons for governments and central banks, which have been implemented around the world. It's in recognition of this contribution that the Nobel Committee has chosen these three economists for this year's Nobel Prize for Economics. And there also appears to be a reason why the Nobel Committee has chosen them, because currently, the world is about to witness yet another financial crisis triggered primarily by the pandemic and also by the prolonged war in Europe between Russia and Ukraine. So this definitely has implications for India as well because the Indian government has also implemented some of these policies. India has implemented the deposit insurance scheme where the government and the central bank are backing the depositors' money with the banking system and they even step in when a bank fails in order to not just protect the depositors' interests, but also to safeguard the overall economy, as seen in the instances of the Yes Bank crisis, 
and the numerous other crises that have hit the cooperative banks in India. Now coming to the last part of our today's discussion, on page number 12 and 15, the Hindu carries two articles that builds a detailed profile of Chinese President Xi Jinping as he is all set for a third term to head the Chinese Communist Party, which will essentially cement Xi Jinping's position as one of the strongest Chinese leaders ever since the days of Mao Zedong. China currently is in the middle of a government transition and the Chinese Communist Party is all set to hold its National Congress where the next Chinese leaders would be chosen to head the Communist Party in critical positions. Xi Jinping over the years has cemented his position within the Communist Party and after completing two full terms, he is all set to become the president for a third term which is unprecedented since the days of Mao Zedong. Because as per the internal constitutional framework of the Communist Party, Chinese presidents have a cap of a maximum of two terms that was laid down under Deng Xiaoping in order to prevent excessive concentration of power in the hands of a few. But the current president Xi Jinping is all set to breach this mandate and through a constitutional amendment, he has cemented his position for a third term and next week he is all set to emerge as the leader of China again through which he will function as not just the President of China, but also as the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, but also as the Chairman of the Central Military Commission, thus giving him supreme power over the Chinese Armed Forces, that is the People Liberation Army, which has been taking an aggressive position against India with regard to the territorial dispute between the two countries. This internal development of China, of course, has serious implications for India, because under Xi Jinping, China has become more ambitious, more outgoing and more aggressive with regard to its economic investments through large-scale grand projects such as the Belt and Road Initiative, which not only challenges India's economic influence and diplomatic influence, but has also posed a serious challenge to India's sovereignty as a key component of the BRI, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, passes through the POK region, which is in direct breach of India's sovereignty. Along with this, under Xi Jinping, China has escalated its territorial disputes with India and other countries and has displayed military aggression that has increased India's threat perception from China. So the continuation of Xi Jinping for another term and the cementing of his position within the Communist Party has serious implications for India and India is closely watching the developments as it appears that India will have to be prepared for another term of aggression and hostility from China under Xi Jinping. Now, as we come to the end of the discussion, let's take a look at a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, critically examine the factors that gave birth to insurgency in Manipur and shed light on its current internal security situation. The second question, elephants are increasingly threatened by human activities. In the light of the statement, evaluate the rising deaths of elephants due to electrocution in India and suggest suitable measures to counter the threat. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the answer writing portal for which the link has been provided in the description box below. So as we bring our discussion to an end, if you found the initiative to be helpful, do let us know by pressing the like button, share the video with other aspirants and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.